Our maverick sitting in front of me right now is a social entrepreneur, Kola Olajide. Thank you. How's it? Thanks are you well? Me. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I mentioned the fact that you're a social entrepreneur, but we'll get to that. The part that I want to sort of get into is, is who you are. You were born in Nigeria, in Lagos. And then you came to South Africa. Why here of all the other countries on the African continent? So it was an uncle of mine who um, was one of the most successful in the family that told me to come and study in South Africa as a pathway to go to Canada. Um, while studying in South Africa, we found out he had cancer and he passed away. So mm. SA was a cheaper education um, you know, option than Canada at the point for my family. And I decided to make the best of the opportunity. Mm. So I stayed. It's an adjustment, isn't it? It's one thing to go from one school to another. It doesn't matter where you are, but it's another to go from one country to another. Do you remember what that was like, that, that adjustment from you know, living in Lagos to coming to South Africa, you know, going to school in Cape Town? Yes, I remember. Um, I would say I think the, the, the biggest transition for me was the food. <laughs> right, so, you know, coming from a, from a spicy region to, sure. to SA, um, I had to like dice everything with spice myself. So you would carry your own Hard spice. spice? Right, just a small pack. You just take it out, do your thing. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that was the, the transition. Um, and also then, wow, I thought Nigerians could party back then, but, whoa, you come to SA, it's a different yeah, ball game. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? so, absolutely. And, so, I mean, yeah. you, you were very young at that time, so you were taking in a lot, learning yeah, a lot, yeah. learning a lot of like new 18, things as well, yeah, yeah? yeah? In the midst of all of this, you've obviously got to think about your future. And then you, you do your matric. What was it that sort of gave you an indication of what you wanted to do with your life? while doing matric, I wanted to study chemical engineering, mm. right? And I, you know, I was tinkering with code and I started writing software back then. And one thing I learned was, um, you know, software was one of the very few avenues that you could basically create whatever you could imagine with z close to zero capital, right? If you're in civil engineering, you need billions and millions to build all these great buildings, right? If you're in software, you just need a creative mind and understanding of how ones and zeros work to create any great thing. I got to work at an organization that, that made me very self-aware, right? Made me understand my strength, my weaknesses mm. as a person, you know, um, and basically identify the skill sets I need to develop to be my best self. And I think the opportunity came because I was selected as a MasterCard Foundation and Zisha Entrepreneur. So this is a program that identifies 12 entrepreneurs in Africa under the age of 22 and basically give them money to do what they want to do and enables them to fail very fast. Ooh. Because they believe the faster you fail, the closer you are to success. I want, I want to take it back because I'm glad you, you brought up the issue of personal development, being self-aware. I feel like a lot of the times we talk about our life journey as, you know, these blocks that you need to tick. But I think it's also important to get to understand who you are and what makes you tick, what your interests are. What were the things that you thought about all the time, you know, that sort of, you know, helped guide you into where you are today? So while in Nigeria, I was in the military school for six years, right? So if you're young in the military school, um, and I was one of the youngest, you, you have a different view of life. For you, it's about survival. For you, it's about yeah. discipline. For you, it's about go-getting and all that. You don't, you think exploring your, the softer parts of yourself is a crime. You don't want to do it. Back then, it means it was shameful to cry as a person for me, hmm. right? Um, you know, but then when you start to explore self-awareness, you start to work with people from different walks of life, um, and you start to unpack those insecurities, and you start to understand people's perspective, and you start to see, okay, man, there's more to life. You know, do hmm. I want to go on this part where I never explore this part of myself, or um, you know, or do I want to unpack this pain or whatever it is, and just be my best self, right? Mm -hmm. So I think who I am today um, is a combination of both worlds. Like, so the discipline to be able to hit the gym at 5, 6 a.m. came from that side of my life. The calmness to be able to engage with, uh, with an annoying client comes from the second part, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I think everything has made me who I am today. And I think that's incredible because even in your journey, as an entrepreneur, dabbling in different spaces, in technology, even in education, et cetera. I mean, those are some of the things that must have prepared you for that journey because a journey is filled with a lot of things. There's success, there's triumph, 
There's also fear and then there's failure. And sometimes you have to confront those, those issues. Yeah. Right. So yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm as proud of my failures as I am of my, you know, success, um, you know, in life, right? I wouldn't have achieved, you know, this level of success if not for the learnings um, with, that, with those failures. So I'm, every time I've tried a new venture, it's always been a, if the previous one failed, I was happy to fail forward. Let's talk about, um, and I suppose being part of a maverick is, yes, you've got your purpose, but you've also got to realize those vulnerabilities and, and almost get a sense of where to go next. But, I mean, let's talk about, you know, your own journey in, in your purpose. I mean, what sort of change did you want to bring to the world? Were you, were you thinking about that when you, were, when you were a student, when you started your first initiative, when you started your first project, your first business? Cool. So I think... Um, so, it, so my my passion for education technology came before entrepreneurship, right? So while studying at school and you know and you leave the school premises and you go home, there was this complete disconnect from your teachers and your peers. Mm. And at the point, um, we had all these other interesting technology in the social space. Mixit was raining back then. How do we get to bring the school home the same way Mixit has allowed people to bring their friends home after mm, school? Mm. And that's when I started building education technology. So back then it was more about how do I solve this problem for myself? Mm. And you know, before, okay, how do we make money from? The more I progressed with EdTech and I, and I shared what I was working on, the more people got excited. And then you know, brought in some, some business minds, we worked together. And that's how my first entrepreneurial venture got off the ground. It was called Funda back Yes, then. yes, indeed. And, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because as you were telling the story, it almost paints a very beautiful picture as to why Funda was even uh, something that came to life, right? So what was it for you? What, what is it that got you off your seat, off the ground to say, no, this can be done? Especially in a world where there's so much that challenges us as, as South Africans, as black Africans as well. So I'd say for me, the biggest drive was my passion mm. um, to see change in, um, in the education sector. Um, and I just think the credibility that came just by sharing um, the story. People just being like, whoa, you know, we believe you can do it. Um, and being very supportive, um, you know, of the journey. Um, and I just believed in myself. And... Um, you know, made sure I um, tried to bring my A game every day on the idea and, you know, made sure it did something great. I mean, one of the things that I learned, and this is through this journey of the Challenges Club, is you, you get a, a room full of like-minded people who are mavericks, uh, maybe even people that don't have the same level of thinking but are all out there challenging things. And we discuss things, but at some point there's got to be the action, the doing. And you're a, a testament to that. So how do you, how do you convince people to to buy into whatever you're doing. How do you say, Here, here's Funda, it's a great project. This is you know, the reason why I want to do it, but I need you to come on board to help me take this idea to the next level. Because I know at, for a lot of people, it's a hurdle. The beauty is um, with my industry is in tech, um, action speaks much louder, right? So mm -hmm. it became easier over time to get people to join whatever venture I am trying to build because of the credibility. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it, it was harder at the beginning. By the way, I'm on to my third venture now called Bridge Labs. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I'd say Bridge Labs was, you know, what was much easier to get off the ground um, than my previous venture. Because when I started Bridge Labs, the mantra at Bridge Labs is do hard things, right? And I always advise young people, you have a short period of time in your life to do hard things and set you apart from your peers. That's my own personal belief, right? You sure. have a very short window mm. in your life, right? For me, that's, you know, within the ages of maybe 22 and 27, right? Um, and that's, and I'll, I'll say that for my personal journey. At that point, I wasn't chasing who was going to pay me the most. I was chasing who was giving me the hardest thing to do that would put my name on the map. That's an interesting thing to, to say because we live in a world where it's about instant gratification. It's about, you know, I want to start today so that I can be famous literally tomorrow. I want to start a YouTube channel that will have a million subscribers by tomorrow. And here you are saying, I'm looking for the hardest challenge in the world. 
when you look at yourself and think, well, I've achieved all of this, but it wasn't easy, what were some of those things that you feared the most? Uh, because I think tapping into that is important, especially when you are on the journey that you've been on. You know, it, it almost feels like you've got to be vulnerable to be able to, to be, you know, cognizant of certain realities, right? When you, when you are on this journey, that it's not going to be easy. No, great, great, great question. I think um, one thing that really worked for me was having mentors, right? While I went through this um, unknown path. And also, with, I have a very um, interesting um, relationship with, with fear and failure. Right. Tell me about it. What, what, what is that relationship? Um, you know, I look at fear as a barrier and an obstacle. I look at failure as a stepping stone. Right. Right. It's that simple to me. Um, so I try to be very logical when I when I approach when I approach fearful situations. So a good example, as an entrepreneur, you know, and you want to grow your team. You see great talent out there, and you want to bring them on board, but you worried. Okay, what if? You know, I lost this big client, and you know, would I have to would I have to let them go? Oh, would they take me to CCMA? All this mm. kind of thing. You have to build an equation that works for you. I didn't build equations for myself. I would then say, okay, Kola, you must have six months' expenses in the bank, right? Once you, if you have that, you should be able to sleep at night and exist and enjoy the present, mm. right? Mm. And with failure, it's like um, the only time I would see failure as a big thing is if I failed for the same reason as I have failed before, then that means I didn't learn anything. Exactly. And and have you been in that situation where you failed? And how how do you handle that? I mean, how do you how do you take that in? Yeah, I'd say my first business um, actually failed, and you know I sat down and I was able to to understand. Okay, this is why it failed. Um, you know what can I learn as an entrepreneur? You see, back then I was a very tech person you wouldn't see me in suits and and stuff <laughs> right yeah, um yeah. you know and you know and growing the business i never involved myself in the, in the business side of things and you know and made some mistakes with how the business was going to be structured back then and a couple of other things um and when i went into my next venture it was like okay um this is not going to happen again mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. i know what needs to happen i work with 18 players because mm -hmm. i know um you know, energy is contagious, right? Um, so I work strictly with 18 players. You know, also I play according to my strengths, right? I don't know you would, if you would ever hear I'm a CEO of an organization because I'm not, I'm a, I'm a CTO, the chief technology officer. That's sure. why people will actually, actually I think the day I cross over to CEO, we will start losing business <laughs> because people will feel because okay, you know where, he's where not you, more, yeah, where people will be like, okay, cool. Kola is no more close to the tech, okay, sure. you know. So, so yeah. And that, that takes an incredible uh, amount of self-awareness to say, well, in a team, I'm, I don't have to wear the number 10 jersey. There's people who can do that for me. I, I'm better suited here. So I think it's an important point you raise. Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explore this concept of fear a bit more because, you know, earlier in our conversation, I mentioned the times we live in now, in, in the middle of a pandemic. And, and here you are, you know, with another venture, Bridge Labs, in the midst of all of this. So, you know, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the realities that you've had to deal with, you know, on the back of this pandemic, trying to build your passion with all the knowledge and experience you've had, with all the recognition you've achieved. What's that like? Man, so... There's no playbook for a pandemic. I don't know anyone who was alive in the last pandemic. In 1918 or whatever <laughs> right? it was. Sure, so sure. Um, so from, it was a case of, you know, learn as you go. So the first shock was um, once the country announced level five, all South African clients pulled back on budget. They were like, we don't know what we don't know. Sure. So we are not going to spend. Sure. What really worked, what saved the company was the fact that we had a diversified client base. If all our clients were based in this country, Bridge Labs would have died by now. And that's a very important business lesson, isn't it? Yeah, very, very important. Very, mm. very important. Now I believe in being more intentional about my global networks. You know, so as we started to go down the levels and people, I know we were hitting lower numbers of, of cases a day, then clients were like, okay, let some budget start trickling in here and there. Mm. 
And in the last quarter of last year, clients just switched up the game. They were like, okay, this team is here to stay. Um, you know, we can if, if they also had, if they don't work for 18 months, they're also going to die most probably. So they have to, to spend so much now so that they can accelerate their digital transformation so that they can be alive. Mm. And in the midst of all of that, you brought more people on board in your own company. Yeah. Which is the opposite of what many companies were doing during that time. We brought people on board and we also did a major salary increase in the company, actually. Right? Why, why was I not working for your company? Did you send your CV? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to no, send I'm it over. Check. I'm going to ask HR. Um, so I think what, what really worked for us was um, the international clients. Mm. Our international deals are not structured in local currency. Uh -huh. Right? So even when the pandemic hit and the rand was taking a dip, the dollar was strong. Hmm. So that balanced out. Hmm. Secondly, um, we sponsor students at UJ. I'm a guest lecturer at UJ, helping them with a couple of things. And, and that's my talent um, pipeline, right? We get students, bright students from the school very early, sponsor them, you know, do whatever they need to, to finish and get them to join our organization. So, I mean, we, you, you've put all these guys through school. It's five, I mean, they're now graduating. Mm. Is that that we take them or other or companies somebody else take, will. So take them? And then sure. you have to look at it. If other companies take them in, all our investments is gone. Mm. So I was doing major pitches to clients. I said, God came through. We landed a very big deal, um, you know, end of last year. And yeah, we brought everyone on board. And then what started happening was international companies looking to get top talent at low cost, started looking at South Africa's engineering resources. And you start to see a lot of tech talent leaving their current companies, but working remotely for companies in the UK mm. and the rest. So I was also facing this, um, another pandemic where my engineers are saying, hey, I'm getting this offer to work in this company and they're offering me in pounds and this. Sure. You got to look at the numbers. You got to look at the talent. You got to look at um, where you want to be, and you got to make the right decision. And 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 in 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 most cases, what what was that like? Most cases, we 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 asked them to stay, and we, I mean, we would compete with the with the international offer. Sure. But the big lesson there for me is, mm. um, if I want to build the best comp engineering company to nurture Africa's best talents, I have to think global. Mm. Because that's the pool you're in. Yeah. And that's, that's the level at which you, you operate. You can say, okay, um, I'm going to employ these people and think of South Africa's salary bracket as the, as the top 1%. No. Because this guy, the top 1% of engineering talent could sit here and work for the best comp, the top 1% in the world and get paid much higher. Mm. So if you want to compete globally, you need to tap into that global client base. I want to take a step back slightly um, and talk about the emotional parts of how this pandemic, you know, played on your mind, you know, on your on, on your on your soul and on your spirit. I mean, I think it affected all of us. You know, what, what was that like? I mean, what sort of, you know, thoughts were in your mind before you went to bed at, at night and when you got up in the morning? I was really worried. I, mean, I still am, right? Mm -hmm. um, but back then, I was really worried. Um, but one thing I've, I've learned to do is, um, even in the worst state of fear, due to unknown factors, I try and be as logical as possible. So um, I know a lot of people hate the World Health Organization and stuff, but I was following them and I was reading and I was looking at data. Even one of my engineers built an interactive graph to show how the pandemic was growing globally. <laughs> so I was looking at this thing and it's, it's tough emotionally, I believe, um, even post pandemic, we still have to grieve properly. Mm. This was a this was an attack on on, on our financial well being and also on our mental health. Mm. Mm. Right, mm. I see friends bury family members and they can't even get close to the family members. This is post pandemic is going to be a thankful season, and you know, be grateful for another lease on life and be more intentional, knowing that okay, my time here is limited. Mm. One of the biggest things is the challenges that we face, you know, as individuals and I guess through the, the organizations we have founded, the ventures we have, even in your particular case. What, what is that? Especially when we look at it from a societal perspective. What do you think is a challenge now 
that is bugging you the most that you that you'd like to solve through your venture at the moment? One of the big goals of Bridge Labs is, you know, put African talent on the map mm. globally. I've been very lucky when I look at my own life journey to have worked in some of the you know best organizations um, and black engineering talent is not represented um, at you know at decision making level why is that right um I mean I it's a combination of factors I mean part of it is systemic um, part of it is just not I mean, general interest, not, you know, we're not interested, we don't see the value. Um, also, part of it is the education system, right? You know, um, you know, and one thing I really want to do is to, to put, um, you know, black engineering talent on the map. If I look at 10 years, 10, 15 years down the line, I want to be able to say, um, oh, most of the chief technology officers at the biggest companies pass through Bridge Labs. Mm. Right, that's mm. a, that's a success for me, and that's right? a uh, that's a very ambitious yeah, no, definitely um, endeavor. Um, you know, so that's a big thing for me, like to see black um, you know talent on the map. Um, you know, now to do that, it's not about how many projects you do; it's about how many hard things you solve. That's and and that's idea. your that's like your your undercurrent, isn't it? Yeah, all but, all the big problems. That's that's where you want to be. Yeah, so it's yeah the, for me the it's most about difficult okay. not to undo. Yeah, so so and I give you some good examples, sure. right? Um, I helped the, a large organization build a learning management system from scratch, you know, um, and I was working with them closely on this, and it was a very successful project, right? Um, and right after that project, anything I wanted to do, I always had an audience. Hmm. People were like, okay, if he did that. Okay, we want to hear what he wants to say. We want to hear what he wants to do next, right? And because of all those hard things, now I get to be listened to, right? Because of those hard things, now Forbes says, okay, you can be a 30 on the 30 member, mm. right? That is how we rewrite this narrative. I can't build a company that does the basic things and does great revenues and say we're changing the narrative. No. Mm. Mm. Right, and I hear people often say, if it doesn't scare you, then it's not worth pursuing. Yeah, for some of us. And right. now, this is not to say everyone should have this life purpose. I don't think entrepreneurship is for everyone. Mm. Right, I really don't think so. Um, you know, and um, so yeah, I think for me, um, you know, back to the point was not you know big thing now is is is, is putting um, black talent on the map. And how do we do that? Um, get projects across the globe. Mm. Um, so you would see me. Um, striking partnerships with Harvard Business School so that when their graduates are coming out, raising funds, starting new ventures, we can say we can build the tech that you're about to, to get off the ground. Mm. And we don't, guess what? We don't even want money. We would take equity in what you're building. Mm. And I'm glad that we're able to put it down to something practically, you know, because there's many challenges, but it's important to, to bring it down to something make it practical, tangible, tangible, so that we know exactly what it is, what it looks like, and, and how, to, how to deal with it. But then I think on a bigger scale, you know, for Kola, what is your, what is your next? What is, yes, you, you develop young talent, you put them through a journey, some of which you've been through, you travel the world, you've built networks and partnerships. I mean, is that, is that all there is to, to you? What, what, is, what is your next? I think I've been pretty successful at building a, a service business. Mm. Right. At some point, I will end up on building a product business, right? Solving one problem for a billion people. And I've been the chance to have a larger impact and make a lot more money. As opposed to now where I'm not the 100% decision maker on the problems we solve. Right. So right now, an organization will come and say, okay, we want to rethink, um, you know, KPI measurement. Okay, that's your problem. We solve it for you. This is how much we charge. Mm. But there's a world where I, I do entrepreneurship 2.0, where I say, this is the problem I want to solve. I mean, Shay, what, what, because when you bring it, it seems like it's there. You, it's a ball. Right. So, you yeah, figure yeah, out what it is. It, it, it's there, right? So, um, you know, and I see, I can see it. I can see how, you know, you could impact, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives in a small period of time and make a lot of money while doing it. Okay, before we wrap this conversation, we know that you are tied to two countries. 
you know, so how do you juggle this relationship between Nigeria and South Africa? I mean, is it something that, that, that you think about? Because, I mean, that's the way you were born. And there are probably millions of people there that have the same sort of challenges that people here have that you've managed to solve. So how have you balanced that relationship with these two countries? I love both countries with my heart, man. Mm. You know, but you know, if I look at who gave me the enabling environment to do what I'm doing today, South Africa gave me the enabling environment, right? Um, and they gave me an exceptional skills because I never had to stress about permit. They allowed me to build my businesses as long as, you know, we're doing the right things. Mm. Um, you know, and yes, we know we have the other issues, but I'm very grateful to this country um, for how far I have come, right? Um, the only thing I would hope they improve is let them start adding some spice to the food. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know. There are some places that I clearly need to take you to where you will find the spice you're looking for. Kola, you are an exceptional human being. Um, your life story is a testament to that. And uh, what you've been able to do is something that a lot of us would love to do. So carry on doing it because there are a lot of people that are, that are watching you and they are trying to take your story and use that as, as, as inspiration for whatever they want to do. Thank you for your time. This is like a journey, isn't it? This is a journey because I'm looking forward to seeing how we're going to solve some of these challenges in particular, the challenge that you're going to share with us about what it is that you'd like to solve with everything you've learned, with all the experience and the knowledge you have. So thank you so much. Um, the beauty about the Challenges Club is, is that it, it's, it's about the talk and, and it's about the action as well. And this is the part where we're at now. It's about the action. So I cannot wait for the journey ahead. Thank you for your no, time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to going on this journey um, you know, with you. Um, so yeah, thank you.